Hey guys, Super Horror Bro Mike here, and in today's video, we venture into a living nightmare as we join two children fighting to survive a world full of monstrous dangers at every turn. This is the story of Little Nightmares 2 Explained. Before beginning, let me quickly outline what this video entails. This exploration of Little Nightmares 2 will serve as both a story recap and theory video. We begin as I walk you, the viewer, through the game, beat by beat, acting as a nice way to catch up on the overall story and its most memorable moments. At certain points we will stop to don our theory caps and analyse key information. With special attention paid to that unforgettably strange and morbid ending and what exactly it all means. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this full breakdown of Little Nightmares 2's story and its ending. The game opens as we are drawn down a long corridor that bends and distorts before our very eyes. A large doorway is found at the end of this corridor, with the door itself featuring a carving of the iconic eye symbol seen throughout the Little Nightmares series. Before we get to see what may lie behind this door, a blast of static sends us flying back out of the television screen in the middle of a forest clearing. Here a young boy with a paper bag covering his head awakens with a jolt. This is Mono, our main protagonist and character we must navigate through the many deadly environments of Little Nightmare's world. Mono seemingly without clear purpose sets off into the gloomy woodland ahead. The deeper into these woods he ventures, the more hostile his surroundings become, forced to evade many dangers including falling trees and bear traps hidden beneath the leafy floor by the local hunter. It isn't long before Mono reaches the cabin of this hunter, and upon finding his way inside, he makes a surprising discovery. Mono follows the sound of music downstairs, and locked inside a basement is a young girl who we know as Six, although her iconic yellow raincoat is nowhere to be seen. She plays a music box which emits a familiar tune. Using a nearby axe, Mono manages to break down the door to Six's prison and spring her free. Unfortunately, she doesn't trust his kindness and takes flight. Mono manages to catch up to Six who is attempting to reach the attic in order to secure her escape. The two soon realise that two heads, no matter how small, are certainly better than one, and so form an uneasy alliance in order to survive. Now things begin to go a little more smoothly as the duo solve puzzles and work together to escape the hunter's clutches. It should also be noted at this point that I will not be going into too much of a detailed analysis and explanation of any of the game's monsters in this video. That will come in a separate video very shortly, or if you would like to see each of these terrors in their full uncut form, you can check out my full 5 part playthrough and see how I reacted to each of their various peculiarities. The hunter hot on their trail, Mono and Six outrun the glare of his flashlight and blasts of his shotgun, wading through slimy swamps and desperately rushing from cover to cover until they happen upon a garden shed. Six locks the door while Mono grabs a spare gun from the wall. It takes all of the strength the two can muster, but justice is served and the hunter given a taste of his own medicine. Clambering onto an old door, Mono and Six take an awkward ride across a misty lake. Six seems deeply troubled, and this unrest seems to be about more than the recent act of murder she just partook in. After all, she is no stranger to that. However, there isn't time to contemplate why, as the children soon find themselves washed ashore outside of a giant urban settlement. This colony is known as the Pale City. The buildings literally buckle and bend under the strain of a transmission emanating from a structure at its centre known as the Signal Tower. The tower is able to distort the very world around it and is responsible for the twisted appearance of the characters living within this nightmarish universe. 
at this time we learn a startling revelation in regard to Mono himself. He approaches a television which seems to be broadcasting a harmful signal. Upon touching the screen, Mono is able to warp and bend the image within. An image we are familiar with as it forms the hallway scene during the opening sequence of the game. Mono straightens out this bendy tunnel and is then warped inside the screen itself. As he heads for the door at the far end, time itself begins to slow and Mono is ejected back into reality. For now the hazardous transmission has been calmed, but what could lie behind the door in that in-between dimension? And why exactly is it calling out to Mono? Mono and Six make their way inside the Pale City, and it isn't long before an ominous building blocks their path forward, a creepy old schoolhouse. Making their way inside this building leads to all manner of hardship. The school is inhabited by mischievous students known as the Bullies, and a terrifying teacher watches over them. This teacher has been so warped by the signal tower that her neck is now able to stretch out like a snake to horrifying lengths. It is also worth noting what exactly it is these students are being taught by their teacher. Looking to the chalkboard here, and the scrawlings of this kid in detention here, we see an eerily common theme. Sketches of those all too familiar eyes, and furthermore, the ominous signal tower itself. It seems the broadcast infects every facet of this world, corrupting the very minds of its inhabitants and brainwashing them into blindly worshipping its rogue transmission. After becoming trapped inside a fallen locker, Mono finds himself powerless to help as Six is overpowered and stolen away by a group of schoolhouse bullies. It is now up to Mono to save his newfound companion, so he continues on alone. A series of hair-raising encounters with both teacher and student unfolds as Mono makes his way through libraries, dinner halls and science labs. Eventually he manages to reunite with Six who has been strung up by her captors. Mono saves her from this torment and the two seem to form a stronger bond because of it. However, at this point in the story, Six's slightly preoccupied demeanour takes a more sinister turn. It isn't long before, upon encountering another bully, Six goes out of her way for vengeance and kills in a very angry and sadistic fashion. It seems a darkness festers within her soul. After escaping through the vents of the schoolhouse with an enraged, bloodthirsty teacher in hot pursuit, the kids find themselves once again on the cold and rainy streets of the Pale City. It isn't long before they happen upon a rather interesting garment of clothing, a yellow raincoat which Six immediately uses to take shelter from the damp outside. This raincoat, and its inclusion at this point in the story of Little Nightmares 2, is an interesting point to pick up on. Why? Well, because it raises some questions as to where exactly in the overall timeline of Little Nightmares this sequel fits. And don't worry, we'll circle back to this very interesting timeline question later. Next stop is the hospital, another creepy building our heroes must traverse on their journey into the heart of darkness. The hospital is home of the Mad Doctor, a grotesque obese creature bundled into a mass of overalls who hangs from the ceilings of the hospital wards, creating horrifying works of art in his surgery. The doctor makes a living via the creation of masks, which he sells onto those who can afford to hide their deformities. This explains why so many monsters from the original game wear these masks, and also why less privileged beings, such as this hunter, must make do with an old potato sack instead. The Doctor isn't the only threat living within the walls of the hospital. Mono and Six encounter living body parts such as these spider-like hands which scuttle through the dimly lit hallways, looking to put the squeeze on anything that crosses their path. Luckily Mono is a dab hand at breaking bones with his hammer. There are also mannequin-like patients. These were once residents of the Pale City who approached the doctor looking for a little cosmetic surgery, but got more than they signed up for. The doctor has removed everything that made these unfortunate souls human, and they now inhabit mannequin bodies shuffling about in the darkness. 
However, shining a light on these patients freezes them to the spot, as if, in that moment, they remember the bright light of the operating theatre and are sent back to a time they had previously forgotten. A time when they were once human. One might ask, how does the doctor transform his patients from human to mannequin and yet keep them alive? It's an interesting question, and once again, one I can only offer my own theory on for you to consider. To explain this process, we must take a look at another element of Little Nightmares 2 I had previously neglected to mention. The Spirit's Children, or glitches as they are referenced in the game's menu screen. These glitches are echoes of the past, souls left behind after the host's body has been taken but remain within the realm of the living as a result of the signal tower and its refusal to let anything escape its broadcast range. These souls are frozen in time by the transmission, so to speak. What's even more interesting about these ghosts is that Mono is able to consume them, sucking them up into his body almost as a form of energy. Keep this in mind for later in the video. The Doctor uses this electric chair to fry his victims, making them stare hypnotically into a drawing linked to the broadcast. This keeps the soul trapped in our reality, and the body can then be disposed of or repurposed for other means. The glitched out soul transferred into a new host body. In this case, the mannequin-esque works of art the Doctor enjoys crafting. Before leaving the hospital, Mono and Six are chased down by the Doctor himself, who luckily does not manage to sign them up for his patient waiting list. Instead, after a mad dash to the incinerator room, the duo are able to trick the Doctor into crawling inside the furnace, burning him alive in a true Hansel and Gretel style moment. Mono and Six leave the hospital behind, now on the final leg of their great adventure. They make their way through the city streets and toward the signal tower at its center. This is where they first encounter the townsfolk. These city dwellers are known as the viewers and stare hypnotically into their television screens, transfixed by the audio and visual oddities transmitted. Some even take things a little too far, falling to their deaths in a desperate attempt to get closer to these screens, while others find the signal tower so calming that they give themselves to the broadcast completely, falling from the tops of buildings as their life force is sapped away. The faces of these viewers are eroded and withered. This is a direct result of the distortion affecting the world of Little Nightmares as a result of the signal tower and its broadcast. We see just what kind of effect this transmission has on brick and mortar around the Pale City, so it's no surprise this distortion causes such affliction and deformity to flesh and bone, which of course is far weaker and more malleable. You may also ask, why are the clothes of these viewers found throughout the city streets and its buildings, as if the people wearing them up and vanished? This question is answered very soon, so hang tight. While exploring a dilapidated building, Mono discovers another TV set broadcasting a powerful transmission. Once again he warps inside, however this time he manages to hold out and reach the door at the end of the hallway, but within seconds Mono wishes he hadn't. Opening the door releases a powerful entity from within, a tall, lanky, all-powerful phantom known as the Thin Man. Just like Mono, Thin Man is able to transition between the world within the television screens and our own reality. Six and Mono desperately try to escape his grasp, but unfortunately, Six doesn't pick the best hiding place and is taken. From this chilling sequence we learn something very unsettling about Thin Man and his implications on the rest of this tormented world. It seems he claims the bodies of these victims. The glitches of the children we find around this world are a result of his actions. Thin Man claims his prey, leaving only an echo of their existence behind, captured in time by the Signal Tower's transmission. This also explains why the clothes of these viewers have been left behind. As a tweet on the official Nightmares account states, where they're going, they won't need these anymore. 
the viewers have been claimed by the signal tower, but before the tower takes their bodies, it first consumes their life force, quite possibly to power itself. As the viewers are transfixed to the broadcast, their bodies erode and energy is drained until they wither and die, at which point Thin Man claims them for the tower. Mono makes his way through the streets alone, avoiding droves of mindless yet savage viewers who seem pretty ticked off every time our hapless adventurer interrupts their static shows. Eventually Mono encounters the horrifying ghost of Thin Man once more, who is able to slow down time whenever he is near bending reality as if it were the signal of a television screen itself. The ghost echo of Six leads Mono to the rainy streets outside of the signal tower itself, where as Thin Man finally catches up, it seems all is lost. However, things are about to take a shocking turn. Mono removes the paper bag from his head, and a swell of energy begins to form around him. We noted earlier in the video that Mono had the ability to access the dimension in between worlds, a place from which the signal tower seems to exist. He also had the ability to consume the glitches of those children taken by Thin Man. We now learn he has a very similar power. In fact, Mono is even stronger than his shadowy nemesis. He takes on Thin Man in an epic battle on the rain-soaked streets, and eventually vanquishes him. As Thin Man fades into eternal rest, Mono bends the city to his will, and warps directly outside the signal tower. Strangely, the doors open wide, as if to welcome him inside. The inside of a signal tower seems to be a dimension unto itself. Gravity exists for Mono as he explores, yet objects float around as if gravity isn't present at all. A pinky purple haze coats everything, and stairs lead Mono through doorway after doorway, seemingly without end. He is guided by one familiar sound, a piece of music any Little Nightmares fan will instantly recognise. The music Mono first heard when he met Six playing with her music box in the Hunter's Cabin. Eventually, this music leads Mono to a strange room full of children's toys, and in this room, he makes a terrible discovery. Six has become warped and distorted herself, bent to the will of the signal tower, and twisted into a giant nightmarish abomination. She closely guards a music box, which she seems very protective over, as if it soothes her torment. Mono realises this music box holds some kind of power over his friend, and so takes a hammer and smashes it with all of his might. This sends Six into a fit of furious rage, and causes the tower to begin revealing its true form. As Six chases Mono through the ever-changing halls of this structure, its walls transform from plaster to flesh. Everything in this place is fake, an illusion to mask the evil festering within. An elaborate boss battle ensues as Mono must stealthily avoid Six and trick her into moving away from her music box so that our hero may sneak in for the attack. With every smash of the box, Six grows weaker, but more agitated. Whenever Mono strikes the music box, he is thrown into darkness, and must locate a wooden doorway and axe to break through in order to return to his tormented friend. It seems the signal tower is able to pull from one's own memories. In Mono's case, it uses a memory he associates with Six, when he first freed her from imprisonment in the Hunter's Cabin, and applies it to his quest to free her here. For Six, the music box is used, the one thing that kept her calm and collected while she was held prisoner herself. However, the tower seems to use this memory against Six, making sure she guards the object that binds her to this twisted form. We know this because when Mono finally delivers the finishing blow and destroys the music box, the signal tower loses its control over Six and returns her to human form. 
Now before we move on to the game's ending, I would like to briefly address my personal theory as to why Six looked and acted this way while held within the Signal Tower. When we think of what exactly the Signal Tower is, it seems to be a living organism, a fleshy mass disguised as a structure. The tower preys on the life force of others and uses its powers to distort and corrupt everything around it. Its fleshy form explains why bodies are taken once their energy has been sapped. Their flesh and bones are consumed to add to the tower's ever-growing mass of body parts. Those trapped inside are reduced to their most basic form. The dark side of their personalities manifest in physical form. For Six, who throughout both Little Nightmares games has shown to possess a cruel and sadistic persona, despite often having good intentions, this manifestation was represented clearly. A bitter, twisted, angry and vengeful creature amplified by the Signal Tower which exploits the very darkest reaches of one's soul. Her only comfort, as stated before, the music box she associated with happy memories, and in the cruelest of twists, the tower used this happy memory to bind her. Six was guarding her own imprisonment. With Six saved from the tower's control, the two adventurers make haste and rush for the exit, the tower now fully revealing itself as a gory mess of flesh, organs and eyeballs. Remember those eye symbols we see throughout the world of Little Nightmares, always watching, the eyes everyone seems obsessed with. Well, they now make total sense, considering this structure that has warped the world into the nightmare it is, is made up from them. Six races ahead, but Mono stumbles. He is left behind as the bridge leading to their escape collapses. At first it seems as though Six will leave him. However, at the last minute, she doubles back and catches Mono by the hand only to let him go a few moments later. So, why this sudden betrayal? Mono saves Six at the beginning of the game, once again in the schoolhouse, and then yet again from the confines of the signal tower. So it seems strange that Six would let him fall, and on purpose no less. However, if we consider the kind of person that Six is, things make a little more sense. You see, Six has always looked out for her own survival first and foremost, and when we consider the events of Little Nightmares 2 and the horrors she encountered while accompanying Mono, it is logical to conclude she grew tired of being put in harm's way. While Mono had saved her, he had also exposed her to many very perilous encounters. Add to that the fact we know Six is not a very trusting person, and after the hardship she has been subjected to, who can blame her? And if we pay close attention to the scenes in which Mono attempts to reach the door within the Signal Dimension, we can see the real reason he is ejected from these television sets is because Six pulls him out, sensing he is being drawn to something sinister. Knowing Mono possesses such radical powers, the same powers as Thin Man himself no less, would be a major red flag. It is likely Six felt threatened by Mono's presence, and was worried he may turn on her at some point. Better to leave him behind, and take no chances. But then, why did she return to him at all? Well, look to the exit. It is made up of a static portal, much like those television screens that Mono uses his powers to transition through at various points during their adventure. Six was never able to travel through these screens herself, because she did not possess such power. If we recall the ending of the original Little Nightmares, you will remember that Six drained the lady of her powers when she herself was powerless. This sequence seems to mirror that scene. Mono, now powerless, hangs in the balance, and Six returns to him and absorbs just enough of his power to allow her to escape without the aid of her newfound friend. We are given confirmation that Six obtains an element of Mono's power in the game's true ending, unlocked by collecting up all 18 glitching remains. Here we witness Six exiting the signal tower through a television screen, much like Mono does, However, this consumption of power has one terrible consequence. It causes Six to glitch herself. Her body cannot handle this new energy, and so while Six is able to channel the power of others, it changes her every time. In this first instance, Six loses her soul, the good she had within. 
Her moral compass is removed and in its place a hunger to fill the void. A hunger we know all too well. That's right, Little Nightmares 2 is no sequel, but a stealth prequel to the events of the original Little Nightmares. Six warps to the moor where she now carries an unquenchable desire to fill the void left by her split soul, a hunger which led to some unfortunate consequences. So Little Nightmares 2 leads directly into the sequel, which we already played back in 2017. Mind blown, right? Now his use has been served, Six discards Mono and leaves him to the mercy of the Signal Tower. But as she escapes, Six doesn't quite realise the horrifying ramifications of her actions. Mono becomes trapped at the bottom of the tower, amongst the flesh and eyes, the signal tower then harnessing his remaining power and channeling itself through him. Mono takes a seat and returns the tower to its fake form, hiding its grotesque appearance behind brick and mortar once again. There is no happy ending here, no escape for poor Mono. Over the years we see him make a chilling transformation. The signal tower corrupts his body and mind. It uses his powers to broadcast out to the world and to drain those of their life force, bending their bodies into hideous forms through the distorted signal it transmits. Mono becomes Thin Man. He has always been Thin Man. The story of Little Nightmares 2 is a never-ending cycle. Mono and his powers exploited though they may be, are the cause of all of the evil and suffering found in all three Little Nightmares games. Six's betrayal turned Mono's pure and innocent mind into one seething with anger and hatred, a hatred the tower now uses to its advantage. You may ask how Thin Man, who we will now refer to as Finn Mono exists in the same time period as Young Mono. After all, the two even threw down against one another. This is fairly easy to explain if we consider how a transmission works. The signal tower puts out a broadcast, but a broadcast has no particular tie to any time zone or period. It is simply a frequency, and as long as there is something to transmit that frequency, then anything living within it is free to travel across time, existing in a separate dimension altogether. So as Thin Man, Mono is able to travel between past, present and future at will. He simply required someone to free him from this prison, and thus travels back to his childhood to try and trick his younger self into opening the door that imprisons him, freeing him from the signal tower's control and releasing him into the outside world. Here, Finn Mono attempts to destroy Six and Young Mono, as their demise would mean an end to this cycle. It would stop Six from betraying his younger self and prevent his eternal imprisonment inside the tower. It would also save the world from eternal damnation. Unfortunately, Mono is always bested by his younger, stronger self, and so the cycle repeats forever, and Mono remains forever trapped. And with that, we have come to the end of this very long and very in-depth video. This is actually far longer than I had planned it to be, but hopefully you enjoyed it and now understand the world of Little Nightmares 2 a little better. Also, it should be said once again that there are many interpretations of this story, and this is simply mine. If you enjoyed watching today, remember to leave a like, comment down below, and subscribe for more horror-related content. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.